So, uh, good afternoon, everyone there, and uh, good morning here in the Philippines. I guess you just had your lunch, so you're all sleepy, I guess. Uh, so, I think we're even. I'm sleepy too. It's 1 a.m. here, so just bear with me, okay? So, um, my topic is about blood conservation management. Uh, third World Edition, How to Conserve Blood on a Budget. My name is uh, Jam. Just call me Jam. It's easier. And uh, I've been a perfusionist for 12 years now. Eight years in the largest cardiovascular surgery hospital in the Philippines, the Philippine Heart Center, which uh, makes around um, 1,500 cases a year. And four years, currently I'm just roaming around uh, other cardiac centers in the entire Philippines as a freelance and private perfusionist. So uh, UST or University of Santo Tomas is just one of the hospitals that I go to. So introduction, for the last three years, the Department of Health here in the Philippines devised a plan to make card cardiac surgery more accessible to the common Filipino. So uh, in the span of 10 years, there are 10 new cardiac centers all over the country. They are being developed to accommodate more open heart surgeries at a more affordable rate. Right here in the Philippines, it's uh, very expensive if to undergo, for example, a cabbage operation. It could cost you around a million pesos. So uh, you can convert it yourself. Uh, so uh, uh, a million pesos for a cabbage uh, patient. But uh, what the government did, uh, they call it the Z-benefit package. Uh, you can have a cabbage surgery for around only 200,000 pesos. 200 to 300,000. So that's uh, significantly cheaper than uh, the 1 million budget before for cabbage patients. But uh, the downside is since the government can only support the basic machines and supplies of cardiac surgery on these new centers, some machines and disposables are not available for routine use. So what I mean is no cell savers, no centrifugal pumps, not even hemoconcentrators, nor albumin. So scientific studies show the need to conserve blood and its components in cardiopulmonary bypass. Uh, a study by Taylor said that the liberal use of RBC transfusion is associated with increased nosocomial infection and mortality in critically ill patients. And uh, another study by and Goren said that uh, blood transfusion during or after cabbage surgery has been shown to be associated with increased long-term morbidity and mortality. Other studies said that uh, excessive hemodilution by Chandler, that a hematocrit below 23 has been linked to being the primary cause of impairment of homeostasis in terms of drop in coagulation and fibrinolytic proteins during CPB. And it is also the principal contributor to organ dysfunction during CPB. So what are we to do as perfusionists? So in conserving blood, what are your goals? I mean, we should have goals, right? Because uh, without a goal, there can be no real success. And to put it simply, without a goal, you can't even score because you don't have a target. So what we did in our team as perfusionists is we made blood conservation goals. We divided them into macro goals and micro goals. So macro goals are basically goals that we as perfusionists can physically or directly affect act upon or measure. For example, to minimize priming volume and CPB circuit, we reduce the surface area, and then 
if you want to optimize oxygenator size and CPB circuit length, we have to cut the our tubings during, uh, I mean, before uh, CPB. Another is to greatly reduce, if not eliminate, the use of allogenic blood components for transfusion. And lastly, to implement, improvise, and use cost-effective blood conservation techniques using available equipments in the operating room. So we also have micro goals. <clears throat> micro goals are the goals that we as a team can indirectly affect or measure. So basically these are more of the cellular level changes or effects that may occur when we achieve those, the macro goals that we had uh, previously. So as you may notice, the macro goals are, are directly correlated with our micro goals. I mean, they complement each other. So first is to avoid delusional coagulopathy, consumption of coagulation factors. So to do that, uh, let's go back to the previous slide. We should uh, minimize priming volume and CPB circuit surface area and so on and so forth. Avoid excessive damage caused by a systemic inflammatory response. Maximize the hemoglobin and hematocrit of the patient during CPB. Uh, what we do is uh, we maintain a 25 hematocrit uh, as our protocol. And we reduce excessive damage to RBCs and platelet aggregation by doing the, the macro goals. So again, a goal without a plan is just a wish. So we devise a blood conservation plan. So before I start with what we have done with the plan, uh, I must reiterate that everyone has a major part in a cost-effective blood conservation plan. An enthusiastic team approach, proper communication, and a combination of efforts among surgeons, anesthesiologists, perfusionists are vital for its success. Even with one member not cooperating, it could jeopardize everything. So plan A is we do ANH or acute normovolemic hemodilution. So I think everyone knows this. So this is our protocol for the ANH. First, uh, it is facilitated by our anesthesiologists. So only patients with a pre-op hematocrit of 40 and above are eligible and patients who are 60 kilos and above are preferred. So no patients below 60 kilos. And our safe endpoint for the ANH is a hematocrit of 30. So our formula for ANH is uh, volume of blood that may be extracted equals to the baseline hem hem hematocrit minus the target hematocrit divided by the average hematocrit multiplied by the estimated blood volume. So this is how it looks, for example, for a uh, patient uh, who is 60 kilos and who has a pre-bypass hematocrit of 40. So uh, for this patient, we can actually extract around two bags of whole blood but it still depends on the anesthesiologist and for us perfusionists if we want to extract two, two bags of whole blood or just one. It, sometimes it depends on the, on the patient, if she's female or, or male, the weight, for example, if uh, what is written on the chart is uh, we, it's not quite what we think the weight of the patient is. So. It, it, it really depends on the anesthesiologist and perfusionist. So contraindications, presence of severe sepsis, respiratory failure, myocardial pump failure, hemorrhagic shock, secondary trauma, and severe anemia. So blood conservation benefits, fresh supply of undamaged RBCs, coagulation factors and platelets after CPB then blood is basically free of risk from transmission of diseases, allergic reactions, and blood banking errors. And perioperative surgical bleeding reduction during hemostasis. And also the autotransfuse blood 
has increased to 2,3 DPG or uh, diphosphoglycerate. So, uh, it is said in studies that uh, autotransfused blood has higher 2,3 DPG which delivers oxygen right away to the tissues as compared to allogenic blood. In some instances, allogenic blood, uh, uh, before they can fully utilize the oxygen, is around uh, 7 hours and above. So, uh, the limitations is uh, excessive blood fluid replacement by the anesthesiologist, for example, resulting in excessive hemodilution. So, uh, perfusion is you have to watch your anesthesiologist too. <laughs> So, uh, uh, a study from uh, Siegel said uh, that the ANH is only moderately effective in reducing transfusions by 10%. So, it says here that one to two units less than the control group during their study. But for me, for us, uh, one, if we can save one or two units of blood, that would be ver very beneficial for the patient since we don't have cell savers and other machines. So plan B is uh, optimization, min miniaturization of the CPB circuit and the use of uh, VAVD or vacuum assist uh, venous drainage. So as much as possible, if all parameters permit, CPB circuit should be maximized in length, the shortest possible without compromising safety and size the smallest possible in all of our patients. And we use the appropriate low prime oxygenators with integrated arterial filters as uh, they, are, they are preferred. So uh, as you can see, we uh, put the uh, oxygenator near the, the pump head, so it's very near. And uh, if you look at our, the table lines, it's almost near our uh, oxygenate, uh, ox the reservoir. So uh, we really uh, try to minimize our CPB circuits. <clears throat> so uh, adult, adult tubing size, uh, VAVD is used in 100% of our adult cases using roller pumps because our some centers we don't have centrifugal pumps so we we only have roller pumps and uh, we reduce the venous line tubing circuit from one half to three eighths and uh, we reduce the priming volume of 56 milliliters per meter of tubing at the venous line so that means 56 more volume to the reservoir so uh, i base this on uh, the study from uh, Von Segeser, uh, who says that uh, per meter of uh, priming, in one four tubing, we have 32, in three eighths, we have 71, and in one half, 127. So by reducing uh, one half uh, Venus line with three eighths, so per meter, you, you save uh, 56 ml. That might not be much, but uh, for us, that, that's a lot already. So uh, benefits other than better venous drainage, VAVD allows us to decrease the surface area and length of the venous line, and we can uh, put the oxygenator nearer to the to the uh, the tubings in the field. So it means increased amount of crit, and then of course those the 56 uh, mL and uh, a meter of um, a meter of tubing would mean less foreign surface, less binding of plasma proteins, and less utilization of clotting factors. Oh yeah, I forgot to, to tell you that uh, we don't use uh, coated, uh, biocompatible or biocoated surfaces for our tubings. That's why I'm, I'm very strict when it comes to, to the length of the tubings. If we can really maximize it, we really do it because it's not biocoated. So uh, as we continue, perioperative peri surgical bleeding reduction during hemostasis and preserve autologous blood. Again, the 2,3 DPG I explained a while ago. 
So disadvantages, if you increase the negative pressure to more than a negative 70, then uh, gaseous microemboli would uh, uh, naturally occur. So GME is associated with post-operative neurocognitive dysfunction. So to avoid that, this is how we manage our VAVD. Negative pressure in uh, our venous reserv reservoir should be monitored continuously and adjusted appropriately for efficient venous return augmentation. So we kind of maintain it around 20 to 25 uh, millimeter of mercury. So again, we do not allow uh, excessive vacuum um, or more than 70 and the rest. <clears throat> okay, so this is how we do it because uh, actually we don't have a dedicated uh, a regulator also and uh, a VAVD machine. So what we use is we attach it to a wall sucker or uh, any, any suckers with a moisture trap for safety. So what we do is, uh, if you can see, there's uh, the two transducers there. First one is the arterial one, and the next transducer below the white with the white sticker, that is uh, how we monitor our negative uh, pressure in the reservoir. So we transduce the, the reservoir with uh, the second transducer to monitor uh, the negative pressure inside the reservoir. And the sphygmomanometer, because we only have two transducers, the uh, sphygmomanometer is used for the cardioplegia pressure. So we have to watch out for, for that. So uh, here it is in the screen. Pressure one is our aortic pressure. Pressure two is the negative pressure in the venous reservoir, okay? So plan C is we do the RAP, retrograde autologous priming. So I mean, everyone knows this one. This is our protocol for, for the RAP. Uh, patients 18 to 70 years old, uh, LV ejection fraction of more than 30%, non-emergency patients, patients without history of stroke, patients weighing 60 kilos and above, non-hypovolemic patients and patient, patients with pre-bypass hematocrit of 30 and above. So uh, <clears throat> for the span of three years, we kind of uh, developed this method, method for around three years already. So first we started with uh, just the tubings, uh, minimizing the length, and then we tried the wrap and then now we do everything. So uh, what happened during that time, uh, this is the improvements that we have made. Better venous line length reduction by the surgeons. So, so uh, before they were kind of hesitant to reduce their venous, venous line, because uh, it looks like there's a big anaconda on the surgical field with the tubing so long. So, uh, good thing they listened after after two years. Okay, so uh, venous line is also exsanguinated first for better uh, blood pressure management, and uh, this will also prevent from any air entrainment in the uh, in the arterial line. Because before we used to uh, exsanguinate the arterial line first, but now we, we do venous, the venous line first. So it's kind of like uh, anti-grade uh, uh, AAP. So, uh, and uh, a better coordination with anesthesiologists because before our BP was kind of uh, having a seesaw effect because uh, man management was kind of poor, <clears throat> sorry. And uh, circuit prime volume is around 500 ml or less because before because of very long tubings and everything we could actually re uh, do the wrap around 800 to a liter of priming volume so that's a lot so by reducing the 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 priming volume by minimizing the lines and using the ap appropriate oxygenators for example uh, 
for example, for less than uh, 1.7 BSA, we use the FX15 uh, for uh, those patients. So further reduction in priming volume. And uh, adequate reservoir volume during CPB. Before, we had really a hard time maintaining our, our volume during, uh, during bypass. So this was before. This was around three years ago. This is how, how much we collect from the wrap. But not, now it's just, just this. Okay, so blood conservation benefits. Decreased hemodilution, coagulopathy, significant increase in intraoperative hematocrit right at the onset of CPB, and decreased RBC transfusion or none at all, and decreased 24-hour chest drainage and promotes decreased lung water accumulation after bypass. So disadvantages of the RAP procedure, decreased circulating blood volume, low reservoir volume, but uh, we kind of uh, uh, have, uh, we have optimized this one already. And a study from uh, Van de Weyl said that only 17% reduction in transfusion rate. But for patients who are uh, less than 1.7, with only 375 ml of fluid, it increased to a whopping 25% reduction in transfusion rate. So basically, we Filipinos, we are not that big and strong than uh, most uh, Caucasians are or other uh, nationalities or, or races. But uh, <clears throat> so uh, we are kind of uh, just average size people or small size people. So uh, doing the RAP is very beneficial for us uh, as demonstrated by my study. And uh, another disadvantage, it can be cumbersome and hard to do without the coordination and support of the whole cardiovascular team. It took me around two years to really convince them to do all of these things. <clears throat> so what I did was we did the all-in or budget package blood conservation plan. So this study involves 60 random adult patients. 20 in the control group where we did nothing, nothing at all, 20 wrap only patients, and then 20 all-in patients. So all patients must meet their respective select, selection criteria, the one that I discussed previously. And pre-bypass hematocrit and intra-op bypass hematocrit are measured and compared among the three groups. Then transfusion of any blood component within the first 48 hours post-bypass will be noted as a simple yes or none. So in, in terms of my study, I just put an asterisk if, uh, if there is no, no blood transfusion. Okay, so what happened was in my study, the control group composed of 20 patients. Uh, from the pre-bypass hematocrit, it drops down to an average of almost half or almost 50%, around 48.71% during the onset of bypass. So the chart looks like this. The blue bar is the pre-bypass hematocrit. As you can see, it's kind of very consistent among all the 20 patients. On bypass hematocrit is almost half of the, of the first bar. Next group is the wrap only group, and uh, the the average uh, hematocrit uh, percent percentage drop is uh, an improved 30.11 percent. So this is how the chart looks. So as you can see, the second bar, the red bar, is uh, just slightly uh, lower than the first. And lastly, the all in group without any cell savers, centrifugal pumps, hemoconcentrators, uh, no machines whatsoever, just uh, the optimization, those three plans that I mentioned earlier, uh, 
has a an average hematocrit percent drop of only 15.87%. And those asterisks, uh, if you can notice, at the at the all-in group are those patients wherein we did not transfuse any allogenic blood or any blood components, no platelets, no fresh frozen plasma, nothing. So this is how it looks. For the all-in group, pre-bypass hematocrit is, uh, the, the on-bypass hematocrit is just dropping around 16% from the uh, pre-bypass hematocrit. So in summary, control group, percent drop is almost half, 48.7 to 1%. Drop only group is 30.11%. And the ANH optimization, min min miniaturization, and wrap VAVD group is a 15.87% drop from the pre bypass hematocrit. And I would just like to note that this is the first time that happened in, in the Philippines, recorded that all of our cases for a month in the University of Santo Tomas. In January, and all of those, uh, just eight cases, but all of them did not use any blood or any components at all. So that's it. Thank you for your time, and God bless you.